Time is a podcast of the Unite Leadership Collective, hosted by Tim Ullman and Jack Caliber. The ULC envisions a future in which all congregations fully equip the priesthood of all believers through world-class leadership development at the local level. Lead Time taps into biblical wisdom for practical solutions to today's burning issues. Each podcast confronts real-time struggles facing the local church in a post-Christian culture. Step into the action with the ULC at uniteleadership.org. This is Lead Time. Welcome to Lead Time. Tim Allman here with Jack Kauberg. I get the privilege today of hanging out um, with a brother that I respect highly in the ministry. And Jack, it's in addition to you. I highly respect you. We get to hang out all the time, but I see your mug every single day and it's a beautiful mug, man. So, but I get to hang out with, with Alec Fisher today. Jack, did you want to respond to my comment there? I don't know. You got to look at me too. No, I think Sorry I'm glad you think so highly of me, Tim. I appreciate that. <laughs> That's wonderful. You're very welcome. You're a beautiful butterfly. Anyway, today we get to hang out with uh, Reverend Dr. Alec Fisher. Let me tell you a little bit about this guy before we get going. Senior pastor at Christ Lutheran Church in Hickory, New North Carolina, a proud member of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, received his back. Listen to this. Like some guy's got a got a bio of, of academia. This is to the next level, Alec. And I know you're going to you're going to hear humility and great wisdom today from Alec, but Bachelor of Arts, University of Florida, which uh, shaped his story with a major in Judaic studies, Judaic studies. He received his Master of Divinity and a Master of his STM, Master of Sacred Theology at Concordia Seminary uh, in 2016 and 19, respectively. During that time, he also studied at I'm going to say this wrong, the Lutherish. Yeah. Theologisch, uh, ha- Theologisch Hochschule in Oberussel, in Germany. Oberussel, yeah. Germany. I knew Oberussel from 2013 <laughs> to 2014, and he is currently a, a Doctor of Philosophy student, so he's on the way to get his PhD right. at the University of Birmingham, where he researches bilingual New Testament manuscripts with the Institute for Textual Scholarship and Electronic Editing. Uh, yeah. Also known as the ITSEE, if you were walking alongside that, in conjunction with the International <laughs> Greek New Testament Project, the IGNTP. Uh, prior to accepting his first call at Christ Lutheran Church, uh, Reverend Fisher served as a pastor at First Evangelical Lutheran Church in Odenton, uh, Maryland, uh, until 2020. It is an honor yeah. to hang out with you today, fresh off, coming off of a conference. This is this is where Alec rolls. He was just at the Society for <laughs> Biblical Literacy, the SBL conference uh, around. Thanksgiving. And uh, so tell us a little bit about that before we get into our conversation today, Alec. Thanks for hanging with us. Yeah. Okay. Well, the, uh, yeah, the society, the society for biblical literature is, uh, it's been around for a long time, uh, since the late 19th century. And it's in a different city every year. Uh, this year was in San Antonio. Other years it's in San Diego and Boston and Denver, and it's uh, it's a place where a bunch of people from all over the world get together and present papers and have discussions on biblical literature, and it is a wide range of people uh, that that come from all over the world, all different kinds of traditions, and it's uh, it's really neat. Um, I when I go to those, I attend the sessions for New Testament textual criticism. Uh, so as you said, you know, my, my work is done at the university of Birmingham in the Institute for textual scholarship and electronic editing. We actually call it ITSI. Uh, so we just say ITSI. And, uh, so we had some people from ITSI presenting, uh, and also with the uh, international Greek new Testament project, which we just say the IGNTP, uh, uh, presenting on all kinds of new projects that are going on right now. So, um, there are, uh, we're getting manuscripts together and using some new methodology, utilizing digital technology uh, to uh, transcribe them and collate them and offer up new editions of the Greek New Testament. So, uh, really you know, the New Testament that we use that, you know, at seminary, uh, there is always there's there's going to be, yes, you know, are. there's a new edition that comes around now planning about every decade. And um, uh, we've never really used this kind of digital technology uh, before up until very recently. Um, and so all, all the manuscripts now are, are kind of going through this. And uh, so uh, it's, it's really exciting. It's a really exciting time to be in the field. Uh, they just started the Matthew Project. So the Matthew manuscripts and uh, the First Corinthians Project and the Galatians Project is underway and the Colossians Project and... Uh, so uh, the the project and the pastoral epistles first first and second Timothy and Titus. So there's a lot of exciting stuff going on right now. So Man. what would be what would be a change like uh, this is being <laughs> updated every decade? What are the types of things yeah. that change 
uh, with these oh, new well, Greek translations? Little stuff. It's little stuff. You know, uh, I, uh, a definite article here, you know, uh, I don't know, preposition there. Um, some things kind of go back and forth uh, depending on what uh, technology has been used uh, in the past. You know, the technology, people don't realize how much of an effect the technology actually has on uh, the text that we're reading. Uh, because you've got, yeah. let's say, 5,800 manuscripts. And it's one thing to take them and kind of kind of eyeball them and kind of sift through them. Uh, but if you can if you can transcribe them into a computer and then have the computer uh, collate them and show you all the differences, they're going to pick up stuff you're going to miss. Uh, or like one of the what's the one of the, the kind of the procedure that's we're using right now is um, taking the digital transcriptions and comparing uh, one manuscript to another. And seeing what percentage of agreement they have in certain test passages. And that kind of helps facilitate. All right. So when you've got two manuscripts that say the same thing, but they only agree with each, you know, in this one place of variation, but they only agree with each other 70 percent in the test passages, maybe um, maybe two different scribes made the same mistake. Right. So uh, maybe they don't actually agree with each other in the way that we uh, had hoped they did or something. So. So, yeah, there's just, uh, you know, the, the technology changes uh, the way that we read it. And, um, it's, it's always been that way. It's always yeah, been that no, way. It's, it's fascinating. I'm curious, like how in the world does a guy get super like stoked about this? I've been around exegetes my whole life and I'm always fascinated. Like where, what was a part of your story connected to the word of God where you're like, I want to get behind the Greek and the Hebrew and not just get by. Yeah. It's one thing to learn the Greek and the Hebrew. It's another thing to learn like how the Greek and the Hebrew New Testament came to be and the Old Testament came to be as we have it today. That's a whole nother level. Uh, shout out to Gibbs and, and Chloe and all these guys that have done this, Velts that have done this over the years. I mean, you kind of stand on the shoulders of, of many men who have gone before that really, really care about deep biblical exegesis. How did that story come about, Alec? Yeah, well, well for me, they are uh, intimately connected there. I mean, so what happened is I finished confirmation at my uh, Lutheran school. I, I was raised, uh, I grew up in Tampa, Florida, born and raised in Tampa, Florida, went to Holy Trinity Lutheran school. Um, it's funny, my, my buddy, uh, Dan Prue is the pastor there now. And, um, and I went through confirmation. Then I started going to youth group at a Baptist church <laughs> and, uh, yeah, those guys were fantastic, good friends uh, to this day. <laughs> and they taught me to read the Bible in a way that I hadn't uh, ever thought about before. And I'll never forget, one of them uh, took me to an exhibit in St. Pete, Florida, right across the bay from Tampa. And it was an exhibit on the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the, the, there, were, there was, a, I, I think, a traveling collection of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And uh, the guy that was there gave a, a presentation on them. And from that point, I was hooked. Um, I was 17 years old. And I'd been reading my Bible, but but something changed that day, and I just started reading it. Uh, I, I uh, would pick up a Bible and read it, and then buy another Bible and read that one. Uh, just one translation to the next. I started learning uh, Hebrew. One of my neighbors was kind enough uh, to uh, tutor me in Hebrew, uh, which was a blast. I'd, I'd gone to a, a, a Jewish community center for for preschool, and um, I, I had a lot of friends who were uh, Jewish and uh, uh, went to their bar mitzvahs and uh, loved hanging out with them. And so, so you know, doing this kind of Hebrew tutoring, I, some of them had, you know, maybe gone to, you know, we knew people had gone to Hebrew school and, and we had nothing like that. You know, and, you know, in the LCMS, we didn't, we didn't have a Greek school or a Hebrew school or anything like that. And so um, I thought, well, I can, I can learn Hebrew. And so uh, I started learning it and. Uh, then I went off to college and decided to major in Judaic studies. And I really wanted to get a good sense of uh, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and also a sense of what what the world was like around the Mediterranean in the first century AD. Now, I didn't really get that <laughs> there. I did learn about the Hebrew Bible, but I also learned a lot about uh, uh, Midrashic uh, Judaism, rabbinic Judaism, uh, from like the second to the seventh century AD. And I took a lot of classes in, in anthropology and, uh, Greek and Roman history and, uh, church history. And, 
I mean, it was it was a very uh, insightful time for me. And I as a part of uh, the Judaic studies program, you had to take modern Hebrew. So I took two years of modern Hebrew. And between my first two years, that first summer, uh, they actually had a fully funded uh, they, they f- could fully fund a student uh, to go to Jerusalem for a summer uh, and, okay. and do the, the Jerusalem Opan, which is an immersion program at Hebrew University. So I studied there for five weeks every single day for six hours a day. Uh, modern Hebrew immersion at the Frank Sinatra International Center. Apparently, he was a big donor. Uh, I've got a picture of that. Uh, his name in, in English and in Hebrew. Um, and uh, and so, so, yeah, I mean, it was a very exciting time for me. I, 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 I had studied Latin in high school. And so I took a, a few Latin classes when I was in college, too. And now I teach it. Um, and uh, and so, yeah, then that was a, that was that really I knew that I wanted to study theology, but even more specifically, historical theology. And if I could, uh, manuscripts, biblical manuscripts. But at that time, it was Old, it was Old Testament manuscripts because I, did, I didn't really know anything else. Um, mm-hmm. That was that was that really got me into the academic stuff and kind of the archaeology, archaeology of it. Um, at the same time, I was I was I was highly influenced by my campus pastors at the University of Florida. Cool. And um, they were you know, they, I, uh, it was in, you know, it was a recent in Lutheran church and, um, I, I, I was very active and, um, I loved being there at, uh, first Lutheran church of Gainesville and they encouraged me. They encouraged me in my studies. They encouraged me in, in the program that I was in and, uh, in my faith. And, um, they, I, I, uh, after going to Jerusalem for a summer, they encouraged me to, to try going other places. So I did. And so I ended up spending a summer uh, in Uganda and spending a summer in Panama. Uh, the first was with LCMS World Mission. I just kind of went over there and met with the missionaries there um, with whom I'm, I'm still friends to this day. And uh, Jake, Gillard, Jake Gillard and Shawn Trump were there at the time. And um, I uh, the next summer I went to Panama with uh, CALM, Central American Lutheran Mission Society. And I was immersed in, in Spanish there. I, I lived with a, uh, an all Spanish speaking family. It was wonderful. They were very uh, gracious hosts uh, to me. Uh, but doing those things and then also leading Bible studies and working with the campus ministry, uh, which I was probably leading two or three Bible studies a week at that time uh, in my last few years of college, um, it really, my, my pastors kind of put this bug into my ear of, you know, asking, have you thought about going to seminary? Cause at that time I, I, my goal, I, I wasn't thinking of going to seminary. I would have gone to, I don't know, I would have applied to university of Chicago or something to study, uh, historical theology or, you know, manuscripts or something like that. And, um, so, so I ended up applying to Concordia Seminary St. Louis and, and going there, uh, which was, um, thankful that I did. Uh, it was a wonderful, I would say four years, but it was longer than four years. Um, I, <laughs> I, I did my, my first two years like normal and I'd come in with Hebrew and, and had to, you know, take the, their Greek class there at the seminary. Um, and then I had another opportunity to go overseas. Uh, so, uh, my then, uh, uh, fiance, and I had discussed uh, going to, you know, spending the year in Germany uh, after we got married. And uh, that's what we did. We got married and a few months later moved to Oberusso, Germany uh, to study at the Lutherische Hochsch- uh, Theologische Hochschule in Oberusso, uh, which is our, our, our sister seminary there with the uh, the Independent Lutheran Church of Germany, uh, the Schelpsteinige Evangelische Lutherische Kirche, the Zelk. Um, And so we were there for a year, which was wonderful. While we were there, our exegetes actually came over there for uh, for a colloquium, an exegetical colloquium. I didn't even realize they were coming. Okay, and um, at the time, um, you know, we had we had studied German and and now I'm learning German by immersion and in classes. And uh, I have one class in in December. We got there in in August and December. I had to give a presentation in German. Um, Wow. So. 
it was kind of, you know, it was this, this like, like what oh, I yeah. did in, in Jerusalem, but much longer and <laughs> much more immersion. And anyway, they, they came over and it was wonderful. You know, I saw you know, some of the guys that you mentioned, um, you know, I remember running into Robbie, Paul Robbie and, and Tim Seleska yeah. on the street, David Adams. And they said, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm going to the grocery store. What are you doing here? You know, and uh, <laughs> anyway, while we were there, uh, Jeff Cloa who was the provost at Concordia St. Louis at the time, gave this paper uh, that was, it was uh, kind of a, a critique or uh, a review of the new Nestle Aland uh, Greek New Testament that had just come out a few years prior, Nestle Aland edition 28. And um, gosh, that presentation, uh, I, w- I was galvanized. I had, I had never really spoken to him uh, prior to that, at least I don't, I don't, I don't think I did. Um, and I went up to him and I said, I want, that's what I want to do. Um, I want to, I want to work on new Testament manuscripts. And so that's what got me in, uh, to that. And he got me set up when I, we went, we came back, uh, did my vicarage in Virginia, Fairfax, Virginia. And, uh, he was giving me reading material at the time, came back to St. Louis and he got me, uh, uh, transcribing manuscripts for the international Greek new Testament project, the museum of the Bible or the not yet museum of the Bible, the green collection. Uh, they had had a program where they were taking graduate students and getting them transcribing manuscripts. And now that project, it's funny that that project is the, the Paul project. It's on first Timothy, second Timothy and Titus. And that's, that's now finally coming to a conclusion. And they've invited me to come Hmm. speak at their conference in uh, June in 2025. Um, because I was one of their transcribers as a student and, um, I finished up my, my time there. I, I took an extra year for the STM and I, uh, studied a, a manuscript, a bilingual manuscript called Codex Bernarianus, uh, Latin and Greek. It's very, very unique. And then it's got a Greek text and then a Latin word, basically word for word Latin over the Greek. Uh, that's wow. not, there's only two other manuscripts like it and they're not of Paul's letters. And this one is of Paul's letters. And so, um, I did my project on that. And at the same time, I, you know, at, at 2017, then I took a call out to Maryland. Um, and so uh, I took my call, started writing my thesis in the same year. And at that same time, Concordia Seminary, um, they had a lot of graduate students who had to pass their past competency exams in different languages like German and Latin. And I was tutoring them, uh, tutoring a lot of them while I was on campus in German and Latin and Greek and Hebrew. And um, they asked me to teach a class uh, online for them. Uh, So I started teaching German and then the next year it it went well. So next year I started teaching Latin. And so I've been doing that for them ever since as well. So Uh, there's a lot. Yeah. It's good, man. It's good. And I'm grateful for you. We're, our stories are very different and I love, <laughs> I love learning from guys that have different passions than I do. And it, you're, you're a gift to the body of Christ. So what would you say, what would you say to a dude like me? They're like, you know, cause we're, we're, we're talking about, you know, some of our tests we're running right now in pastoral formation and trying to raise up local bivocational, co-vocational leaders and things like that. What would you say to a guy who has a little bit of kind of apostolic influence over a number of different, um, they may not be young leaders, but they're young in terms of their exegetical understanding. What would you say to them in terms of how they develop that love and respect for the original language is the scripture and why that's so, so important for those that are heading into being proclaimers of the word, Alec, what would you say to them? I think that, I think that one I think there's probably different approaches to, you know, mm-hmm. to why, why people learn Hebrew or learn Greek. What did it for me was seeing that, you know, the, the Bible that you have in your hands is a translation and it's the word of God. It is the, the Holy spirit uses that and shapes us. Um, but knowing, knowing kind of where that came from and the long tradition where that came from, that there are these artifacts in the church that they've been around for hundreds of, if not, you know, over a thousand years, you know, I think of like a Codex Sinaiticus, which is up in the British library right now, or uh, Codex Vaticanus, which is in the Vatican library uh, from the fourth century AD. Mm. And uh, 
in, in, in papyri that are, that are <laughs> held in Oxford or by the Egyptian Exploration Society that, that go back to the second century AD. Hmm. And, um, and I think it's easy. I think it's easy for us to get into the mindset that there's kind of only the here and now, and there's only ever been the here and now. And so why not just kind of read my Bible in English and kind of whatever it says, uh, that's, you know, that, that's kind of good enough. And I think, I think it, it is for most people. Um, if you're a teacher and you are, uh, you're teaching the Bible, um, I think kind of getting that historical glimpse or having an appreciation for where it came from is really important. Uh, and therefore actually kind of knowing, knowing what the words say, I'll give you an example. It's like, if someone came to me and told me they were a Shakespeare expert and, uh, and let's say we weren't here, we were in France and I said, okay, well, uh, do you know English? And they said, well, no, I read Shakespeare in French. I would say, that's great, but I kind of want someone <laughs> who can read Shakespeare in English. You know, I could same thing, say the same thing, you know, you know, if I, if someone came to me and said they were a Goethe expert and, and they only read Goethe in English and not in German, you know, I mean, there's, there's, I think it's an important bit. And I think there, there's, there, there is, you know, anyone can take a Bible and sit down and read it in their own language. I mean, that it's pretty, it's, that itself is, is incredible, but, Amazing. um, but there are some things that are ambiguous in English that aren't ambiguous in Greek or Hebrew. You know, what, and, what would be an example of that? I'm su super curious. Where, where would you okay, say that right, there's. Well, I mean, there's lots of them. Let, let's take uh, Galatians. OK, um, I love Galatians. Galatians chapter four. Right. And uh, Paul is talking about how he's been let me just kind of pull it up here. All right. So Paul is talking about his relationship with his, with the Galatians. You, you know, it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. Now, this might not be a perfect example. I think it's good enough. So you could, if you're teaching or preaching on this text, you could probably walk away from this and, and have two different mindsets. How do you read that? Is it, you did not scorn me or despise me, but receive me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. That is, as you received an angel of God or as you've received Christ Jesus, or is it as you receive me as an angel would receive me or Christ Jesus would receive me? Hmm. I mean, and the in Greek, English, Greek it's kind of ambiguous. How to read that. It is, what? it is, but the Greek tells us how to rightly, the Greek is going to tell us how to rightly understand that, right, Alex? Very clearly. Right. But I think that there would be even like, let's say, in Lutheran circles, I think that if you didn't know, if you didn't know Greek or didn't know anything about that passage, you you would probably be inclined to say you would receive me as Christ receives me. Mm. Right. Because yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm hurting and Christ is the one who receives me. Um, but it's in, in Greek, it's very clear uh, that the the angel uh, as an angel of God, angels in the accusative case and then uh you know, uh, Christon uh, Yezun is also in the accusative case. So it's very clear in Greek that you would receive me as you would receive an angel of God as you would receive Christ Jesus. Right. So, I mean, yep. in English, it's kind of as ambiguous. a messenger. Right. As a messenger. Yeah. As a messenger, as an angel. Yeah. Um, yeah speaking for Christ. So. So, yeah. I, 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 again, I think that's a good that's a decent example of. um in English, it's a little ambiguous, but in Greek, it's clear as day. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, what are the primary so, tools that? Yeah, go ahead. Before I go on, I got some other questions. No, please, ahead, please keep going. keep going. Yeah, <laughs> just other tools. No, no, no. This is awesome. What tools, though, would you say uh, are really, really helpful for folks if they're starting to just? Yeah, I, I don't know if I'm ever going to be a pastor or whatever, yeah. but I'm I'm interested. Is it logos? What what tools would you say would be helpful for just the everyday Bible loving follower of Jesus? Well, that, that, that depends if, if it's something like you want to look at a specific word and okay, what's the, you don't know anything about Greek or Hebrew and you want to know something about this word, then yeah, logos or, um, uh, accordance would be helpful. Sure. Um, but then again, it's kind of hard because if you don't know how the language functions, you could also, 
<laughs> you, yeah. you might just be better off with ESV, <laughs> you know, let, let the right. translation experts kind of take you. There. I mean, that's another mistake, yeah. you know, so, um, no, or I would, the Concordia I would, study Bible that's got some context in right. there. Right. Right. So I would, I would encourage <clears> people <throat> that if you're, if you're thinking about it, um, uh, to, to start just trying to learn the language, like the basics of the language. If it's something, I mean, it's kind of like language is, it's not like a one and done kind of thing. You know, competency is one that you get, you get better at it as time goes on. You know, you can't learn, you can't learn a language in just a few weeks and think, you know, the language language is something that takes a lot of time to actually learn. And, um, I think it's, you know, I would encourage someone to, to pick up a, and there's a lot of tools for, for, for people who are, you know, just starting out and just wanting to learn the language there. Uh, if you, if you kind of know a little bit of the language, there are, uh, Greek readers out there where you can have a whole new Testament in Greek. And then the difficult words are, con- you know, grammatical constructions are there in the notes. Um, but I would, I would just, I would suggest kind of making the leap to try to learn the language. I would almost yeah. rather that than then going into logos and kind of, you know, trying to decipher something that you might not come out. You might not come out with something very good, even if you think it is. Yeah, Um, no. So shout out right now to to Reverend Dr. Mark Hainer, who has a Greek and a Hebrew class that's available via Zoom. And if you would like more information on that, just hit us up at our website, uniteleadership.org. We'd love to connect you. We've got a lot of lay lay folks, as well as those that are training with Luther House and beyond, who are in on on those classes right now, Alec. Would you recommend? I mean, that's a great primer, right, to enter into the language with Mark. Mark is a a, uh, very knowledgeable with Greek and Hebrew. Um, and that's his thing, Hebrew. Um, and, uh, and yeah, he's a, he's a great teacher. I, you know, he's, yeah, he's got, uh, he, I know he's teaching, uh, he's, uh, had a few cohorts, uh, come through and, and yeah, something like that would be really helpful to just, just yeah. sit with someone and just kind of try to learn the language. Um, yeah. I've got a few guys in my circuit and kind of beyond, uh, that I've been doing Greek with for the last 10 weeks or so. And it's been really amazing. Um, yeah. these, these are pastors who went through the SMP program, specific ministry pastor program. And, um, you know, Greek is not a part of their program, but they want to learn Greek. So we're, we're doing Greek. Um, and, and it's, it's better than trying to kind of pick apart the language through a program because now they can sit there. And so what they've, that, what they've done is they've got their basic grammar books. And I've also told them to get the Greek reader so they can go through the Greek reader and they can they're starting over the last 10 weeks. Now they can read more and more uh, and they've got their helps below uh, for vocabulary and grammar, um, but they get excited about it. See, it's exciting when you can actually pick not just look at it on a computer or something, but when you can pick up a Bible in Greek and read like half a verse even like that's exciting. Yeah. You know, I, and I think if, if people saw that or had that experience more than they would, they would uh, see that there's a there's a whole there's a whole other world of, of biblical language out there uh, that that opens up the Bible in a way that they never saw it before. Manuscripts are what did that for me. You know, yeah. Th- this it. may before, seem like a dumb ahead, question. Because um, I know, like, Tim, you said you're trying to pick up Spanish because you're doing some more work down. You've been doing some work mm-hmm. down in Mexico. Do they have things like Duolingo or stuff where you can go in there and actually be able to learn some of these ancient languages, Hebrew and Greek? They, well, they well remember uh, modern Hebrew uh, was built. Uh, L.A. is or Ben Yehuda. This is my Judaic studies speaking. Yeah. Uh, uh, from in the early 20th century, built modern Hebrew off of ancient Hebrew, so you can actually go in and to let's say Rosetta Stone and learn Hebrew. And mm-hmm. it's not going to be exa- I mean, you'll have to take a book then and learn a little bit of extra stuff for for ancient Hebrew, but right. it's pretty darn close. Um, okay. So yeah, I, I would highly recommend it. Hebrew does not have a whole lot of words in it. It scares ah. people because of the characters, um, yeah. the alphabet. They don't look but like I, anything. That's right. But once yeah. you get past that, um, it's a very accessible language because there isn't, there's not a whole lot of vocabulary words in it. So, so yeah, you can do that. Um, Greek might be a little more difficult. Uh, there is a movement I know of, uh, of, of learning kind of Greek and Latin. It's kind of a, it's from the classics side of things, learning Greek and Latin, uh, not just by reading it, but by speaking it, that's kind of been picking up. I don't know 
I can't name off the top of my head any programs, but they're out yeah. there. Um, I know because David Maxwell at Concordia Seminary has been kind of playing around with those things. Um, there would it. not be a reformation if it wasn't for people who are willing to absolutely nerd out on these old languages and be able to make, you know, kind of rediscover some of the things from right. the original sources. Right. Right. And I, you can't underestimate how important this type of work is. So I, I just, I really applaud you to uh, lean into this kind of thing. We need people, well, not me, but we need <laughs> other people <laughs> to do this. <laughs> That's always the comment I get about manuscripts. I'm glad somebody does it, you know? Um, yeah, no, it, it opens up a world and you realize that, uh, that is, there's so much more going on. And even if the translation, let's say the ESV translation is a great translation, but there are certain, I mean, when you have to pick one word, you know, and, and one way to phrase it, like that's what, that's what you've got, you know? And um, you realize that, that the way some of these, uh, you know, gospel writers, the way that they're writing is really incredible. I, I remember Jim Veltz likes to make the point and I, he's right about this, you know, in, in like the gospel of Luke or the gospel of Mark, when, when Jesus is up in Galilee, he's kind of talking like he's uh, in more of a rural area and the language, everyone's kind of talking that way. And then when he gets into Jerusalem and is talking with kind of the elites, the language is elevated to more of a classical style, you know, and, and wow. there's, it's, you know, in English, we would be able to detect it immediately. Right? Yeah. We would be able to detect it immediately, Slightly. but in we green, see that with politicians where they will talk differently to different formal. groups. Right. That's right. Yeah. Formal That's right. Formal so, speech. Yeah. so it's a, it's a part of the narrative. It's a, it's a part of it. And there's so many things like that. There's so many things like that in the new Testament and in the old Testament or, or here's another one in, in Hebrew. English does English has so many different vocabularies. It likes to use different words. It doesn't like to double up on words. We think this is a kind of a King James thing. We we like the variety of our vocabulary. We you know, uh, we've got a German vocabulary and a Latin vocabulary and a, and a French vocabulary, which is still kind of a Latin vocabulary and, and a Greek vocabulary. Um, but, you know, it's it's one thing to call something uh, kingly versus royal or regal. Right. Those are all the same word, just different languages or or, you know, water sports versus <clears throat> aquatics. You know, there, I mean, so we love to we love to keep variety. But let's say in Hebrew, there isn't that kind of variety. So in the Old Testament, when you're reading and you're reading all this great English variety in the language and you realize that the writer is using the same word over and over and over again and English keeps giving it a new word. Uh, mm. Hey, maybe that word is actually kind of important <laughs> and maybe it would be good to translate that word the same way over and over again. And we just don't really do that. But you wouldn't see it if you uh, if you didn't read it in Hebrew, you know, uh, Alec, this is I, I'm going to pivot to another because yeah, there's so much please. we can talk about here. Uh, but before <laughs> I do that, I would be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about the higher critical method and even even your understanding historically of because we still we're going to pivot towards some LCMS conversation here yep. and and our battle over the Bible around the higher critical method in the late 60s and early 70s. And and your kind of take on that and how that even is still maybe coloring some of our disagreements today. Uh, like any thoughts there? Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, I, I actually, you know, being a Judaic studies major at the University of Florida, you better believe that we did a lot of uh, higher criticism. Now, I don't do higher criticism. I do lower criticism. Um one of the one of the easy ways to kind of uh, keep that difference kind of in check is that lower criticism deals with this, like the the stuff that's actually there. So grammar, you can look at the you can look at the words on the page. Grammar is a part of lower criti criticism. My my bit in, in textual criticism, I know it's got that word in it, but um, is you can pick up these actual physical manuscripts and you're actually dealing with the physical manuscripts that are there that you're in the room with. Okay. So you're dealing with actual artifacts. Higher criticism is much more theoretical and you're trying to reconstruct a world uh, based on the text that you're looking at. And you're really trying to kind of look past the text. And, um, and so at the university of Florida, we, we would, we did this in my Hebrew Bibles literature classes where we get to, you know, we, we would learn about the different uh, theoretical sources that would made up the Torah uh, the, you know, some people worshiped uh, Yahweh as God. So the way that they write about things is going to, they're going to 
they're going to use the name Yahweh. Other, other, you know, other group in Canaan uh, wrote about things, you know, they had Elohim as their God. And so that when they wrote about things, uh, they would uh, use the name El or Elohim. And, and Elohim was much more uh, transcendent and, and uh, kind of, uh, you know, distant than Yahweh. He was much more imminent and uh, dealt with people uh in a more straightforward manner. And, and then you had the, the priestly cast and they, the priests would, they cared about numbers and calendars and seasons and all that stuff related to the, the tabernacle. Then you had uh, the, the Deuteronomical source who basically wrote Deuteronomy and, and kind of pulled it all together. And then you had a redactor that brought it all together into to, to five books. It, so that, that's the theory. And it's all, it's all completely theoretical. Right. And so in our classes, we, what, what? Speculative. speculative. That's a good word. Yeah. And so, uh, and so in our classes, we would get a sheet of paper on, let's say the exam and it would be, it would be, you know, God tells Moses to do something. And then Moses, uh, reiterates the instructions to the people of Israel. Okay. And, and one would say Y like Yahwist or J and the other one would say E for Elist or Elo, you know, uh, Eloist or Elohim. Uh, an E source. And we'd have to, in, in the exam, say why this is a J source and why this was an E source. And that was the exam. And so what I would do is I would, I would tell, I would say exactly what, what it was supposed to be, you know, um, uh, you know, give all the description. And then uh, I forget, I did this one time I crossed out on the top. Uh, J, it was like, a, I think it was a, the J and I said, God said, and then I crossed out the E and said, <laughs> Moses said, and I was doing I was doing narrative work without even realizing it. I get a hundred on the exam, right? Um, because I could tell the differences, but at the same time, my professor didn't care that I I didn't I I wasn't up for the speculation. Um, so I I did that all that all the way through college. I kind of dealt with that, and um, you know I I know that. I know that the Missouri Synod had a, had a, had a very uh, difficult time uh, engaging all of that. Um, my personal experience was, you know, I, well, I knew the Bible and I, and I was, and, and, you know, I, I <laughs> believed in Jesus. And uh, so when I was, when I was given these things, it, you know, I just, it was kind of, for me, it was almost like a, a, a new task or a, a new way to engage. So I, I actually, <laughs> I had a lot of fun doing that. <laughs> it's all talking Bible awesome. study. And and I'll even refer back to some of those things and talk about how, you know, certain scholars are, you know, skeptical about this or they like this theory here. And then I say, but, you know, the text doesn't really lend itself to that. Um, I'm, I'm, when I'm teaching from the Old Testament, I care about, I care, I care about the fact that these are real people and that these are, these real people are going through something. And, and I want to see kind of how, how they deal with it and how God deals with them. Um, so, so yeah, so that, that, you know, I, I did higher criticism enough to know uh, that I'm not a higher critic, but it was interesting to me because I didn't know anything about it in the Missouri Synod before going to seminary. I think I raised my hand one time in class and asked, don't some scholar, and I wanted to sound smart. Don't some scholars think that this is a J source and that my fellow students just, they went after me and I had no idea why I had no idea. Um, and, and I was kind of joking, uh, but they, but then I learned all about the Missouri Synod and the walkout and, and all that stuff. And, and I thought, oh, wow, there's some baggage here. I, won't, I have to Don't be careful around, you, you know, I had a joke <laughs> around y'all. Um, <laughs> to talking Q. Um, maybe Q to fill in the blank account, for some but, people. Yeah. Uh what what is the controversy behind that? Like why why do some people feel so passionately about uh, or let's say they're concerned about the higher critical method for uh, scripture? Or because the way that it was used in the '60s and in the '70s mm -hmm. in the in the broader uh, in the broader culture. So let's say even like I was talking before about the Society of Biblical Literature. And, you know, mm -hmm. the, you know, yep. the larger exegetical community in, around the world, yeah. um, it was being used in the broader culture, uh, to undermine the text. Fascinating. Right. What would be and an so example not, of undermining it? I'm, I'm curious. Uh, 
Well, I mean, you would, and you would, so you, it's, there's such a spectrum here. I mean, you've got people that, like, I don't do source criticism, but mm-hmm. I know that there are people that, that do source criticism and some, uh, some will say, well, this kind of proves that this is, this is all nonsense. And then some you'll have are otherwise very faith exegetes and Christians. Um, so there's definitely a spectrum there. Um, so yeah, you might have someone say, well, here's, here's an example. Um, all right. Jerob, when, when the monarchy falls in Israel or it divides and Jeroboam, uh, sets up his new temples. Remember the people make him king. This is after Rehoboam, Solomon's son kind of messes things up and is a little too, uh, uh, a little too into himself here. And, uh, he gets the people upset with him. All the North leaves. They abandon Judah. Okay. And Jeroboam becomes, he was a, he was a political rival of King Solomon. Jeroboam uh, is made the King of the North. And, uh, and, and what he says is he sets up a temple in the North and in the South of his territory. And he builds a golden calf for each one. And he says to the people, these are the gods that brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Okay. Well, you'll have, Someone who's, uh, let's say, a higher critic will say, well, you know, you might ask the question in Exodus when Aaron, uh, when he makes one golden calf and says, these are the gods that brought you up out of the land of Egypt. You might ask, why is he saying these instead of this? Why is it plural? And they would say that the whole story with Aaron and Moses is all kind of made up during the monarchy. And, uh, and it's, it's pro Judah. Okay. And so what they're doing is they're taking the words of Jeroboam and they're putting them in, in the mouth of Aaron, uh, in painting Aaron as someone who leads Israel astray. And therefore Jeroboam is someone who leads Israel astray. Right. It's like, like political propaganda. Okay? Mm. Um, so things like that. You know, and I, uh, I mean, and you can read and, and see, well, yeah, I mean, a lot of the Old Testament is pro Judah, <laughs> um, but <Yeah. laughs> it just is because of the nature of it all. Um, but, but yeah, that, that doesn't do a whole lot in helping people believe that God brought his people up out of the land of Egypt and right. saved them, which is the way that they recognize him throughout all the Old Testament, right? Um, or, or maybe an example might be in creation. Is that meant to be understood as a parable or is that meant to be understood as a true historical narrative? Yeah, that would be, that would be a question of genre, right? Yeah. Um, right. So, so yeah, a lot of my stuff I did kind of the old Testament, then there's the new Testament stuff. And, and Tim, I think you mentioned Q, right? So a new Testament version would be something like there's a source that we don't know. It's called Q and you can, you can go in, and, and see all of the word for word parallels between Matthew, Mark and Luke. And, and they say, well, that, that came from an independent source prior. And, and it might be used to undermine the authorship of Matthew, Mark and Luke. Right. Um, now that being said, what I've, what I learned, <laughs> what I learned in my, in, you know, you know, in classes with this stuff is that some of the people that are doing this are very good with the text and they know the text very well. Um, and I think that one of our issues when we kind of look at that and are maybe scared by it is I think rightfully so we don't want to undermine the text and it has been used that way. Hmm. But I think there's, we've got a sense of insecurity that it forces us to recognize that we maybe don't know the text as well as we think we do or should. Hmm. And so by not by not engaging it, I think it's an act of fear in a lot of ways, because if you've got someone who can point out details and, you know, quote Jeroboam and say that he's, you know, um, you know, saying that, you know, this is this is the same thing that uh, Aaron said, like, I've never heard any. Th- I've never heard that comparison made in a in a church. I heard I mean, that's a pretty careful reading of the text. I, I heard that in a, in a secular Old Testament classroom. Um, so I think that, I think that's, uh, that's important for us. Ah, uh, this is, 
This is good, man. Um, I love your passion for the Word of God, and it all it all stems from God's love for you, centered in the the gospel narrative. Um, let's let's just closing closing up. Talk about the yeah. Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. I mean. We were products of this church body, gone through our seminaries. I went through Concordia, uh, Seward, Nebraska, and, you know, had amazing, amazing professors. So, so blessed. And and yet I, I lament, and part of the reason why the ULC exists and this, this podcast exists is just I lament the way we we treat one another and yeah. and don't recognize the the gifting the varied gifts that are within the body of Christ and and uh, what are some of your primary hopes for the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod especially as it relates to we're not fighting over the bible right now Alec yeah. No one's yeah, having big higher critical. We're not, those are not the, uh, the issues we're dealing with today. I think it's way more sociology than it is theology, but love to get your take on it. Well, I would, first of all, I would love to meet somebody who's in the LCMS who's a higher critic. I've not, yeah, <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't met one. Uh, so if you can, if someone can show me uh, somebody that is, uh, that would be very interesting to me. I think, I mean, I'd be more fascinated than anything else. Um, but no, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think, I think a lot of it is fear. I've, I mean, I've obviously, you know, doing manuscript studies and textual criticism, I was, um, I was accused of higher criticism. Uh, I have been, and, um, you know, it's funny because I spent four years of my life pushing back against higher criticism, right? It's very ironic for me. Um, and uh, um, and yeah, I think that if if there was more of a uh, if if we if we weren't afraid to engage the Bible better, I think that's what we need to do. Uh, engage engage the Bible better than we are right now, um, and. Uh, and, and actually read it and read it in its original languages um, and uh, make that make that a, you know, something that's actually important for us. Um, you know, as far as the way that we interact with people, uh, I think that if we were more confident in our reading and own biblical literacy, then we probably wouldn't attack people uh, the way that, that the way that we see in the Missouri Synod. Um, How so? What, what do you, make that connection. I, how so? Why wouldn't we? Well, because I think that if we if we uh, have a reading of the text uh, and or I'm sorry, if when you, when you open up the Bible, you read things that you don't normally hear in a church. I mean, you just don't. You just oh, you open up, you read from the Catholic epistles, you read from a lot of Paul and you hear phrases and things that you just don't typically hear in Missouri Senate churches. And I think that scares people. And I think it scares even pastors. Um and if we did read those things and encounter those things regularly, they wouldn't scare us. And so when someone used the phrase that we're not familiar with or, or talked about the Bible in a certain way that we're not familiar with, then it, we, we would be more, uh, we, would, we would approach it more with a spirit of humility and intrigue and curiosity than with fear. If, if people knew more about the biblical manuscripts, had any idea about our biblical manuscripts, um, then they would look at kind of what I do, I think, and be very curious rather than kind of uh, hold someone like me, you know, in, at arm's length, right? Which, which, is, which has happened. Um, so again, I think it's just a matter of, of knowing what we've got uh, in the Bible, in the tradition of the transmission of the Bible. Um, but uh, but is, if we don't, if we can't do that, then all it's going to be is, you know, ad hominem attacks and uh, kind of push anyone who does that away, right? And the easiest yeah. way to do it is not dealing with the actual content because you actually have to know something in order to deal with the content, uh, but just, right. you know, uh, making someone out to be, you know, uh, 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 a 60, 1960s or 1970s, you know, liberal or something from, you know, from a, a bygone day in the Missouri Senate. Yeah, and I know you've experienced that in various circles, and for that I'm very sorry. Would you get more... Yeah. Would you get more specific, um, though, like what parts of, say, Paul, don't you think we're reading, which would lead us toward humility? I gosh, I would love. Why don't we read Second Corinthians and read Paul's struggles? <laughs> you know, that's one of my favorite books, Second um, Corinthians. And, you know, and, and we talk, you know, we 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 will quote it here and there, uh, but just reading reading the love that Paul has for these Corinthians and how he's kind of talked in a way that's got, <laughs> that's got them upset. 
<laughs> and is now trying to smooth everything over with Titus. Um, the way that he exegetes uh, Exodus there and talking about the veil um, and uh, the kind of the the everlasting uh, covenant w- with the spirit. Um, right now, I'm actually t- we're in uh, for Advent, our series here is we're actually talking about apocalyptic literature where we're mm-hmm. reading the minor prophets. Uh, which Beautiful. when do we ever talk about the minor prophets, rarely, you know, rarely. maybe, maybe <laughs> Joel two for Pentecost or something right. uh, and talking about why, you know, why apocalyptic literature even existed and, and then opens up the whole book of revelation for us, you know? Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think, I think that there's a, there's a lot that we can do in that way. And, and, and also transparency, you know, even at the higher, you know, levels. Um, so yeah, I mean, Tim, you had mentioned Cordia Seward, uh, I was I was up for a position there. I mean, not that uh, you know they were they were going to extend a call uh, to me um, uh, for assistant professor there, and uh, you know maybe we would have prayerfully you know uh, considered the call, but that was shot down uh, immediately with no reason given. You know, it's like there with no conversation, <clears throat> and um, and if we had more. If we had a, if we cared more about uh, conversing with each other and uh, getting to know the 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 biblical text, I think a lot of that would just kind of go away, because we'd realize that the people that we thought were th- were threats might actually be your your biggest ally, <laughs> um, mm. because because yeah. you we we need people who know the Bible. And we need yes. people who know the Bible, who want to uh, talk positively about it. And, uh, you know, it's one thing to talk positively. We do a lot of talking about the Bible in the Missouri Synod. Right? Um, and if we knew it better uh, uh, and talk positively about it, then we'd be better off. Uh, then ta- we, it's like when we talk about it and then we hear something that we don't like that's actually from the Bible, then we, <laughs> we kind of cave in on ourselves. Um, so, so yeah, I, th- I think, I think that would go a long ways because we wouldn't, you know, when you're, when you become insecure about something, that's when you start attacking people and you start kind of circling the wagons yeah. and you, you act from a fearful posture. One of my, one of my buddies likes to point out that my, one of the things that I like to say a lot is we, we operate with a, a, a hermeneutic of fear. Okay? Yeah. Um, and if we, if we weren't so insecure about uh, the biblical text and, um, we would engage it more and, and wouldn't be afraid when, when others engage it too, you know, mm. um, we'd be excited about it. I imagine we'd be excited about it. My, my it's, Bible studies, I got something people, to learn. people tell me that my Bible studies are exciting. They see, you know, yeah. it, it jumps off the page. We have to be excited about what's happening in the biblical text. We should be able to read Second Kings and be excited about it and understand, you know, what what's going on with Assyria and Babylon and uh, seeing seeing, you know, ourselves in this world today where where, you know, we live in something we live in a chaotic world with all kinds of different narratives. And uh, the biblical narrative is is God's narrative. It's the creator's uh, way of, 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 of talking about the world. And uh, mm. if, if we could, you know, cling to that and, uh, and see ourselves as a part of his narrative, then um, a lot of that other stuff kind of, uh, we become resilient and, yes. uh, and, and, and we trust that, that, that Jesus Christ is, uh, has defeated death, has defeated sin for us and is returning and, and making all things new uh, for us. And therefore we can live our lives as Christians uh, unafraid of whatever's going on around us because our narrative is, is the narrative of the way things are. So, yes, yes, Alec, dude, I'm praying for a day in the LCMS where there is more faith, more unity, more love, more curiosity, less condemnation, less fear, less, I'm just going to throw it out there, less lists, L-I-S-T-S, of the right type of Lutherans who are in the right circle. Uh, That is all power. That is not, that is not the way of Jesus. And so for those who do not cross into other different areas and contexts and um, with, with curiosity rather than condemnation, for those who are in leadership roles that live by lists rather than living by curiosity and care for the wider body of Christ, 
Um, this is a call. This is a call for you toward repentance and change in the name of Jesus for the sake of yeah. the movement of the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, because we are united under the cross of Christ. And I don't know anybody that could listen to you talk um, or anybody that li- could listen to you speak that says, one, you're not a Lutheran exegete. You're a Christian exegete. You're a conservative follower of Jesus yeah. who deeply loves who deeply loves the word of God and wants to seek out the riches, mine the riches of it in its original language. And we need more Alec Fishers uh, to be bold uh, stepping into this. So I'm proud of you, bro. Keep doing Thanks, what you're Tim. doing. We need we need you. We need your your um, the depth of knowledge that you have to keep us tethered to the one grand narrative that you were referring to at the end. That's what it's about, man, from creation to recreation. The days are short and uh, the time is too short for us to backbite at one another or or fear when the perfect love of God casts out all fear. We know whose we are. We know who wins. And so let's go, man. Let's be united in mission. Jack, any closing comments on the conversation? It's been fun. Yeah, this has been very enriching. I've been loving uh, hearing your story and uh, just really excited about the way that people like you are contributing to understanding the Bible uh, more, more richly, more thoroughly. And, and I agree. I think, um, you know, our faith that we find in scripture gives us the strength and the freedom to have an open hand in life, right? We don't need to yeah. hold things so tightly and be afraid. And, you know, one of the things that I'm learning is I don't have to defend God. God can defend yeah. himself. He doesn't need me to defend him. <laughs> Right. He, he's way better at defending himself than I am being his defender. And so yeah. let the scripture speak for itself, you know, and, and not not feel anxious uh, when when somebody maybe misunderstands something or maybe there's something I don't understand properly. Or maybe, I'm, you know, we're talking past each other on a specific yeah. topic. If we can just be calm and be trusting in God as we go into these conversations, I think we're just way healthier for it. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Amen. Alec, how can people connect with you if they desire, man? How can they follow you? I mean, they can send me an email or I'm on Twitter and Facebook and um, Twitter handle is Fisher Alec at Fisher Alec. It's very creative. Um, but yeah. uh, you can with email no C, me. At, it's F-I-S-H-E-R, right? The, the English way. Yes. Not the German the spelling. English yes. Way. It's uh, F-I-L. Sure. Yeah. Fisher, F-I-S-H-E-R, Alec, A-L-E-C. So there's a C in that one. Um, yeah. And then, uh, you, I mean, you can you can email me at A-R-F-I-S-H-E-R-623 at gmail.com also. Um, or just Google this church, Christ Lutheran Church in Hickory, North Carolina. Christ Lutheran Church, man. This has been a great time. Uh, Jack, wonderful work as always. Sharing is caring. Like, subscribe, comment wherever it is you take in. Uh, ULC podcasts like Lead Time. This is Lead Time or the American Reformation podcast. And we continue to have wonderful guests like Alex who stretch us, especially in Lead Time, that stretch us, uh, that challenge us that yearn for the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod to be united in mission through word and sacrament to make Jesus known. It's a good day. Go and make it a great day. Thanks so much, Alec. Thanks so much, Jack. Yeah, thank you, guys. God bless. You've been listening to Lead Time, a podcast of the Unite Leadership Collective. The ULC's mission is to collaborate with the local church to discover, develop, and deploy leaders through biblical Lutheran doctrine and innovative methods. To partner with us in this gospel message, subscribe to our channel, then go to the uniteleadership.org to create your free login for exclusive material and resources, and then to explore ways in which you can sponsor an episode. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for next week's episode.